All right, so we're looking at the Odyssey, and hopefully we're going to finish it today. But it is going to be the, cell, the whole second half in, uh, in one class, so I'm going to have to get a move on. Um, fortunately, what I say at the beginning is, in a sense, um, building up the most important aspects of any story, which is establishing the plot line <laughs> and the conventions that are used and has introduced us to the characters. And once the characters and their worldview, the plot line, the machinery, in this case, the gods orchestrating all the events to a certain outcome have been set up, then it's just telling the story. And you can, I, you can focus on the story and spend a great deal of time on it, and it's very interesting. But I don't have as much work for myself to do to explain to you uh, what's going on because you can see it for yourself pretty clearly. You didn't, you don't need me to do that. Um, we left off in book 12 with Odysseus having gone down to the underworld and f uh, having found out from Tiresias, the prophet, the blind prophet, how to get home. And so he's getting a knowledge that he would not have had either, and he's getting it from a uh, highly credible creditable source for the ancient world, which is the underworld, which is rather dark, to put it mildly. But this is the ancient view of things, is in some ways uh, oaths sworn from below are of more potency than those sworn uh, from on high. Well, um, that's because the realm of the dead is where the mortals go. All right, they, they're going to belong there. Now, eventually, we're going to find in Plato's rendering of what happens in the whole cosmology, you know, but this is Plato's view, not necessarily the Greeks, there is a reincarnation of sorts after a thousand years. You're dipped in the, the stream of the river called Lethe, which makes you forget your identity, and then you're uh, given another identity. But Lethe uh, makes you forget. That's not here in the Odyssey, that's Plato's idea that there is a reincarnation of the soul, but then the soul is not connected to the body. So there's something being said about human nature there, which is going to be very much contrary to Christian views of human nature, in which your identity is not just your spirit, but also connected to that physical body. They are distinct, but united. Very important uh, Christian doctrine. I'll say more about that when we come to uh, Virgil's Aeneid, where he starts to flesh out all sorts of things, including I think this was asked last time, is there not a different uh, fate for those who are the good guys and the bad guys in Homer's uh, telling of it? And the answer is not really. They don't see uh, justice per se. They go down to the realms of the dead. The only justice is, I guess, they get a good reputation on earth. But it's not a differentiated punishment per se. We will see that in Virgil promoting the idea of uh, rewards. Uh, in, a dis in, in book 13, though, uh, we get what we have not yet had, which is the meeting between Odysseus and Athena. So the, the goddess who has orchestrated the whole plot thus far, remember at the beginning, she approached her father, Zeus, and said, you know, how about, how about Odysseus? Why is he languishing away on this island uh, and not able to get home? Of all of the mortals, he was the most pious. He always made sure to pay homage to the gods. He burnt all sorts of bulls, etc. He was very, he did everything right, and yet he is being treated as if he did everything wrong. This is a scandal, and the fates have said that he's going to get home. So why isn't he home? Right? So that's how the whole thing began. And the gods were preventing him from getting home. Poseidon said, you can't get home. Athena said, we're going to make it happen. Zeus has sided with her while Poseidon's away. And now they finally meet in uh, book 13. So book 13, we're still in the land of the Phaeacians, but Athena herself appears to him. And now how does she appear to him? Pre preparations for his departure... And um, the semi-divine uh, Phaeacians uh, send him off. 
enter in a sort of divine cave and they go through this and they get he gets back to Ithaca. It's a sort of a secret passage. When Poseidon finds out about this, he's outraged. You know, you tricked me. And Zeus, being the politician that he is, has to throw him a bone. How, how am I going to placate Poseidon? Well, he's already home. There's nothing we can do about that. Well, he did what he had to do, which is to fulfill the fates. The fates, this, he can't change what's fated. This is the thing about the gods. As, as powerful as they might be by human standards, they can't change what is fated. It's a deterministic universe. It's not chaotic. Nothing happens that isn't fated. And so there's a fixity about this world. And there are fixed moral standards in this world. And there are punishments for transgressing them, and they're very strict. And it's and good people ought to observe them and not transgress them. That that is clear, and that's one of the points about Odysseus. He did the right things, and yet he's not getting what he deserves. So Zeus acknowledges this. But as I say, Zeus, the politician, agrees that the Phaeacians going forward will never again be able to convey men back to their worlds. And the ship that they used is turned to stone. So this is not happening again. And the land of the Phaeacians can no longer be accessed. And what he's, what's interesting here is Odysseus brings back many treasures, not from Troy, but from the Phaeacians. They load him up with treasure. And, and this is part of his arete. Now, I talked about arete primarily in uh, moral or spiritual terms, so of excellence. But a man's excellence is to be seen not only in his honor, it's also to be seen in his wealth. And this is why uh, people of this age plunder others, because it is a sign of their greatness. They want trophies, just like athletes. They want trophies. Yes, I play the sport, but at the end of it all, I want to point to all the trophies I want. That will be a sign that I'm amongst the greatest. They, you hear athletes talk about this to this day. They want trophies. So how ambitious are they? Well, if they're, amb if they're really ambitious, they're going to quit the Leafs and go to another team where they're going to win trophies. Sorry. Cheap shot. I'm a Toronto fan. I'm just embittered. But that's, that's what they do it because they want to win. Likewise, the heroes here want a, a sign of that. And it's a... It's a physical sign. It sounds a little bit vulgar, but it, it, remember, it is not the wealth per se. It's what it signifies. It signifies that you are a man of honor that the gods themselves have honored. And that's the way the world looks at these things anyway. R wealthy people are seen as being favored by the gods. Poor people, the opposite. It isn't always so. It's not even so in Homer's world. We're going to find that, that despite the conventions, that a very poor man, the poorest man in Odysseus's kingdom, a pig farmer, a swineherd, welcomes him, shows him hospitality. And he, he is so praised by Homer that he calls him out. He names him. Like the, the, the narrator comes in and speaks, you, Eumaeus, oh, my swineherd, like, like he breaks in. You didn't even know that Homer was there, but there he is. He comes in and speaks. That becomes an epic convention, by the way. When the uh, narrator, the epic poet, remember the muses are telling the story, but now the poet himself speaks because he's so moved by the honorable character of someone who is not associated with honor that he jumps in and praises it. We'll find that Virgil does this. <coughs> Pardon me. We'll find that Milton does this. And they do it at key points in the stories as well. Sometimes it's to praise a character. Sometimes it's to lament what they're about to do, which he wishes they wouldn't do. So when Eve is about to eat the forbidden fruit, Milton speaks, comes out from the background. But uh, 
so Odysseus has brought back treasures and they are a sign of his arete, his excellence. He's going to come home a hero and look like a hero. Tangible evidence here. And of course he comes back with the fame. He already had the fame. Remember they're singing tales about him already, but the tale's not done. The tale didn't tell how Odysseus got home because he hasn't got home. And that will be changed at the end of this story. But Athena is helping him now. She's been helping him all along. How does she help? Like sometimes she actively intercedes. Here she covers Ithaca with a fog so that even Odysseus won't recognize it. So he's home and he does not recognize the place on which he's landed. And she adds to this by disguising herself. She's going to test him, Athena. She disguises herself as a shepherd boy. Remember uh, when he landed on Scoria, where Nausicaa and the uh, demigods were, he didn't know who she was, where they were, what sort of place this was, etc. And so he had to test her. Wasn't sure. That testing is part of uh, wise conduct. Let me ask questions. Let me not be too candid with who I am until I can find out more about who you are. But revealing your identity is giving somebody power over you. Naming somebody, you think about in scripture what the power of naming entails. There's a certain mastery that goes with it. Children's, children are named by their parents. They don't have any choice in it. Um, and the name has connotations for the parents, usually. In scripture, it has very strong connotations. It has character. Uh, attributes connected with Jesus names are significant God's names are significant right they may say something about the person but it does entail dominion or mastery Adam names the animals in Genesis 2:15, right God parades the animals before Adam Adam names the animals he's saying not just this is a dog he's saying something in the name about the character of the animal that he's naming that's so he's a scientist as it were you have to understand this with names. It's not just a, a sound. There's, there's a sense that goes with that. And it involves, as I say, mastery. You know what that thing is. So if you give somebody your name, they know a great deal about you. They know you, your history, where you're from, who your parents are, all that sort of thing goes with a name. So with that knowledge, you can do bad things. Think about an identity theft in our day. You can represent yourself as that person to others, and then you can do all manner of bad things. That's the case in the ancient world as well. And we've already seen that Odysseus acted foolishly by exposing himself to Polyphemus, right? He told him his name. You know, you want to, you want to know who blinded you? I'll tell you who it was. Tell them it was Odysseus Sacker of cities. Like he's really angry, shakes his fist and he gets shipwrecked for it and he can't get home for 10 years. That's a harsh lesson. Uh, he's not going to do that again. So he is now in Ithaca, but he doesn't know that he's in Ithaca. And that's because Athena hides that fact from him because she wants to find out, did he learn his lesson about revealing his identity? That's what she's going to test. Has Odysseus made progress as a character? We've seen that his son has. Telemachus has learned a great deal about being a man because she tutored him. She gave him wisdom. She took him out from under his mother's skirts. He went, found out about his father uh, from Menelaus and the old man of the sea and so forth. There was all sorts of voyages there and he's growing up a little bit now. How about this figure of Odysseus, the main hero? Well, she's going to test him. Uh, page well, it's page 204, but it's, it's chapter 13, line uh, 236. In turn, the gray-eyed goddess Athena answered, You are some innocent, O stranger, or else you've come from far away if you ask about this land, for it is not so nameless as all that. There are indeed many who know it, whether among those who live towards the east and the sunrise, or those who live up and far towards the mist and darkness. See now, this is a rugged country and not 
for the driving of horses. But neither is it so unpleasant, though not widely shapen, for there is abundant grain for bread grown here. It produces wine, and there is always rain, and the dew to make it fertile. It is good to feed goats and cattle, and timber is there of all sorts, and watering place is good enough, good through the seasons. So that, stranger, the name of Ithaca has gone even to Troy, though they say that it is very far from Achaean country. Finds out he's home. He had no idea. The strangers revealed it to him. So she spoke, and resourceful, great Odysseus was happy, rejoicing in the land of his fathers, when Pallas Athena, daughter of Zeus of the Aegis, told him the truth of it. And so he answered her again and dressed, addressed her in winged words, but he did not tell her the truth, but checked that word from the outset, forever using it to every advantage, the mind that was in him. I heard the name of Ithaca when I was in wide Crete, far away across the sea. Now I myself have come here with these goods that you see, but leaving as much again to my children. I have fled in exile because I killed the son of Idomeneus. Or Silochus, a man swift of foot, who in wide Crete surpassed all other mortal men. So he comes up with a very well-contrived lie. The end of all that, 287. So he spoke. The goddess, gray-eyed Athena, smiled on him and stroked him with her hand. Remember, this was a shepherd boy before. Suddenly, she appears like a woman. Strokes him with her hand, took on the shape of a woman, both beautiful and tall and well-versed in glorious handiworks, and spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words, saying, it would be a sharp one and a stealthy one who would ever get past you in any contriving, even if it were a god against you. You wretch! You so devious, never weary of tricks, then you would not even in your own country give over your ways of deceiving and your thievish tales. She means this as flattery. She's praising him. She's not mocking him. In scripture, a figure who's a bit like this is Jacob. He's a trickster. He lies. He cheats, deceives. It's not seen in a flattering way in scripture. We're not supposed to praise Jacob for being a shyster. But here it is. It's meant to be praiseworthy that he is like this. It defies our sense of right and wrong, by the way. But there is a sense of, there's a worldly cunning that goes with telling lies and deceiving other people that's being praised here. And he sa- she goes on to say, they are near to you in your very nature, your thievish tales. But come, let us talk no more of this, for you and I both know sharp practice, since you are far the best of all mortal men for counsel and stories. And I, among all the divinities, am famous for wit and sharpness. And yet you never recognized Pallas Athene, daughter of Zeus, the one who is always standing beside you and guarding you in every endeavor. And it was I who made you loved by all the Phaeacians. And now again I am here to help you in your devising of schemes and to hide the possessions which the haughty Phaeacians bestowed. It was my, by my thought and counsel, on you as you started for home, and to tell you all the troubles you are destined to suffer in your well-wrought house. But you must, of necessity, endure all and tell no one out of all the men and the women that you've come back from your wanderings. But you must endure much grief in silence, standing and facing men in their violence. Note all sorts of things here. She praises him for being deceitful. She also counsels him in order to be wise, to tell no one, man or woman, and says that that doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy path. You're going to have to suffer. So something's being said here about the connection between wisdom and suffering. But it's conjoined with lying, which scripture is not going to recommend, commend in any way. But going, conjoining suffering and wisdom certainly comes there. If you are one of God's 
children, you will suffer. God uses suffering to produce a harvest of righteousness. There's, a, there's a, an outcome to the suffering, and it is used. But it's not to be done about through falsehood. That's a different matter. So just note, compare, contrast, it's interesting. Similarities, but also differences. By the way, he's going to suffer not because he's a liar. That's not why he's suffering. So it's not because he is being deceitful. He's going to suffer in a, a way seemingly unconnected to the deceit. Yes? Uh, why does he say, like, why does the sheep dress him in wings or words? I constantly hear that. Yeah, constantly, yeah. There's a, there's a whole variety of phrases that recur. And you would think, you know, modern authors would find a different way of, they'd look up their thesaurus and find, is there a different way of putting wing words? It's partly its oral character. Remember, the poet is singing this, reciting it, and it has a certain meter to it. So whatever the original in the Greek is, I'm not sure off the top of my head, it will have a cadence to it and a meter. It helps him preserve the meter. But also, um, they're not worried about inventive ways of putting it. What's the best way of putting it? So if you speak well, then you speak with winged words. It has come up over and over. And it seems a bit repetitive. Likewise, Athena is always gray-eyed. Some goddesses have white arms. God, no, this goddess has gray eyes. Is there any significance to that? Oh, who knows? But it, it is an epithet. It's an adjective. It's multiple words put together to describe someone. And it's prized in some ways. White arms. Um, she doesn't have to labor out in the fields often, you know, right? So there's a, some nobility associated with that. I don't think it's really about whiteness. It's more about not having to work than, more than anything, right? The question at the back, I, I, I got a lot to get through here today, but no. I don't think that a general statement about that is made, but a, uh, we see examples of great suffering being associated with wise characters. One of them was actually Tiresias, who gave him the counsel to how to get home. We'll hear more about him when we look at Sophocles, Oedipus, the king. We're going to meet Tiresias again, the blind prophet. And we're going to find that he has to suffer a lot of abuse. So there's something also being said about truth-telling in the case of Tiresias. Odysseus is not renowned as a truth-teller. He's renowned as a liar, and he's renowned about getting his goals, and lying is one of the ways he does it, but not Tiresias. He will hold to the gods. He's, he's more of a prophetic figure, uh, not Odysseus, not prophetic. So you could see it more with the task of being a prophet that, that suffering comes with it. Certainly in scripture, there's associations between being a prophet, speaking truth to power, if you will, and suffering. Prophets are never part of the establishment. To be establishment and prophet almost is a contradiction in term. Because you're speaking against the establishment. That's the point of the prophet. You can't be part of it if you're going to be. Sorry? Right. Well, you're, you're complicit in it, and to some degree you share their point of view, but a prophet is, is disputing it. And guess what? If you're part of the in crowd and you speak against them, they're not going to want you to be with them anymore. You're out. You get your one shot and you're sure. And then they're going to disparage you. Right? They're going to attack you, try and destroy your reputation because if what you say is true is true, then you're going to destroy their reputation. So it then becomes a war as, as it were. We'll see that when we come to uh, Oedipus the king. We will see that, that that is exactly what is at stake because uh, there are two figures that claim to be prophetic. Uh, but here, it's not associated with truth-telling. It's not merit. It's just sort of with it. Um, not a moral attribute, but he will have to suffer. And part of suffering is being crafty. Again, we're not going to see that when it comes to the tragedians. So there's a development there and a 
closer proximity to truth, I would say, because the tragedy is written in the context of Athens, the Athens of who? Plato and Socrates, men who are renowned for the truth and who suffer for it. And that, then the tragedians will connect truth-telling with suffering much more closely. Here in Homer, not so much. In fact, they seem almost unrelated. And guess what? The, the philosophers are not going to like that one little bit. Because they will say that the people who, who lie, the sophists, get rewarded. They don't tell the truth. They tell people what they want to hear. They sell their teaching for the highest cost, and people think it's the best teaching because they paid however much money it was to get this teaching, so it must be the best teaching. Sophists are very happy to tell them that what they want to hear, never what they don't want to hear. Never trust the person who only ever tells you what you want to hear. So there is a sort of an epiphany here. Athena reveals herself as a uh, beautiful woman, and she prepares him for what is about to come, which is suffering. And she, she, she personifies him, and he, to some degree, personifies her. There's a lot of identification going on here. But note that wisdom and truth are not connected here. As I say, the philosophers are going to hate that. And we share the philosophers' views on this. But it will also be associated with, with techne, with skills, with crafts, with wit, with storytelling, with keeping your head under fire. All those things are associated with wisdom. But to some degree, lying and storytelling are go together here. This is from the from the uh, poets. They they're they're not saying we're telling you a true story. So Plato is going to use that against them. We'll come to that when we talk about the Republic. So what has happened thus far? Well, the the suitors are being prepared for their outcome, which is vengeance, justice. Like they're being set up. Athena is going to punish them. Um, Ithaca has become an inverted world. It's the effect of Poseidon's rule in Odysseus's absence. It's upside down. Things have become violent and disordered. Just like Poseidon, the earth shaker, he shakes everything up. There's no order, no stability. Um, and there's dramatic irony at this point. Uh, Odysseus, the lord of Ithaca, has to disguise himself as a beggar to come into his own country. This is not the way it should be. Like, if you go to an, into another country, you should be able to present yourself as yourself, particularly your own country. He is the, the king, and it shows how corrupt things have become that he can't just come back and say, I'm home. So he's going to have to be clever about it. So he comes as, a, as, a, as the lowest of all characters, somebody who is a stranger and a beggar. And he, the first person he meets is Eumaeus the swineherd. Now Eumaeus is a fascinating character because although he is the lowest on the social totem pole, he was once himself a king's son. This is not no, he wasn't born into the state, he was enslaved. Not all slavery in the ancient world, uh, it, it's not all the same. You could be enslaved, uh, and what you lose is the right of self-determination, more or less. But you can be treated very well by your master. And one of the things we find out about Odysseus is that he did treat Eumaeus very well, although he was his slave. He couldn't do what he wanted to. And it's a deplorable state, and he doesn't like it. But still, he likes the fact that even though he has lost all of his rights, he's still treated well by his master. It speaks somewhat well of Odysseus that he treats him well. Aristotle will commend that slave masters treat their slaves well. It's there throughout the ancient world. None of them question the institution of slavery as such, as being dehumanizing. That's a scriptural emphasis. It's in the Bible. Right? We see it in Exodus. This is dehumanizing in some way. The Greeks tend to agree it is dehumanizing, but it's just the way things are. There's no way of changing this. Those who want to bring about the God's will in heaven on earth as it is in heaven 
think that they can do better than that. And so slavery has been sought to be banished wherever Christians have had the uh, sway to do so. It still happens, but then there's a pushback. No, it's wrong, right? Not in the Greeks, not in the Romans. It happens. You capture another country, you enslave them. And they become your prizes. And you can do with them whatever you want. The best of their counselors say you should treat them well, but they're still your, your property. So you are dehumanized in the process. You lose uh, self-determination at the very least. Um, so what is interesting there is that Eumaeus tells his story to this stranger. He doesn't know it's Odysseus. He tells him to ease his suffering, and it eases his suffering rather somewhat by telling him the story. Again, we see the, the function of narrative. It's almost therapeutic. And we find, and this is really interesting, and it also is to some degree a testimony to how disordered the kingdom of Ithaca was when uh, Odysseus was away, that Telemachus has had no father figure. We found that at the outset, right? That's why Mentor had, Athena in the guise of Mentor had to do her work. But there was actually a father figure, and it was Eumaeus. The man at the very bottom of the social totem pole took pity on this young boy and treated him like his son. Why? Because it was the right thing to do, but also because Odysseus treated him well, even though he was a slave. So there's, again, role modeling. He followed his master's footsteps. He treated him like a son. And so there's affinity to Odysseus amongst this. And again, this speaks so well of Odysseus. Those who were the, at the bottom of the social, social totem pole were loyal to Odysseus. So that speaks well of Odysseus, as well as Eumaeus. Now, Homer is going to praise Eumaeus for it. Because it's easy for Odysseus, in a sense, like he's done the right thing, he didn't have to do it, but it's not praiseworthy, whereas the slave didn't have to do it, and nobody would have expected any different. And, but he did it because it was the right thing. He did the right thing because it was right. Now, Homer jumps out and, and says, full of praise, Eumaeus, oh my swineherd, oh my swineherd. Well, this is how a man like you ought to behave. And they never do, but you did. So the, 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 uh, the epic poet, to some degree, is better than his portrait of the way the world is. He realizes things ought to be this way. How did he come to it? Um, I think through common grace. Just the way things are made. Romans 1 talks about it, right? Men are without excuse because they see God's uh, creative power in the way in which things were made. He, they see that. They know that. Now, they don't have a full understanding of the gods or of God. They think there are many gods. They think they're at war or whatever. But he still knows right from wrong and still thinks that there's an ideal that every human being ought to aspire to, even though he doesn't see that they're acting that way. But the something in him knows that it should be better than he can discern. So there's an element of truth about what they're saying, but it, again, they see only a shadow of the full truth. And this is why it's a value to, to us even. Like everyone has a sense of right and wrong. Well, in scripture, it, it, it says that they do until they sear their consciences. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's what it says in Romans 1. Like they do know, and then they deny it. But it's not they never knew, it's that they don't act upon it. And if they repeatedly deny it, they no longer see what, the, and this is the problem with lying, by the way, is that you lose the capacity to discern what you said corresponding to any reality. The reality is whatever I made up. This is the thing about liars. They can't even remember what they said because, of course, it bore no correspondence to their experience. They're just making it up. So it's easy to catch a liar in a lie because they, they don't remember what they said. Right? Eventually, you're going to trip yourself up. And after a while, if you're a really good liar, you have to sell it to people. Well, then you have to act 
like this is the true story. and if you act, it's called method acting, then you lose yourself in the role of the liar. well, what was actually the truth? they don't even know anymore that's realistic. that's what happens. you don't want to be in that position you lose your own identity. You, you trick other people, but you harm your soul the most. actually, that's plato says that the liar larm, harms his own soul more than anyone else. and a tyrant is the most wretched of all human beings because nobody will correct him because they're afraid of him. so he gets lost in his lies. he can never find the truth, etc. it's very interesting. consistent, of course. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. In uh, 16, uh, this is book 16, line 300. Odysseus and uh, Telemachus meet and uh, he reveals himself to his son, finally. It takes time. But he makes him swear, if truly you are my son, line 300, book 16, if truly you are my son and born of our own blood, then let nobody hear that Odysseus is in the palace. Let not Laertes hear of it. That's his, his father, his grand, Laertes is uh, Telemachus' grandfather. Neither let the swineherd, the swineherd who treated himself, don't let him know of it. No, let no one in the household know, not even Penelope herself. You and I alone will judge the faith of the women. And besides these, we can make trial of the serving men to see whether any of them is true to us and full of humility, or whether no one cares, or, or whether one cares nothing for you and denies your greatness. Okay, so now the two of them are going to find out who has been loyal, faithful, etc. He allows Telemachus, who is now like a mirror image of himself, to act in full knowledge. He trusts him. But no one else. It seems rather harsh on his poor wife, for one thing, who has been faithful to him and wise in her deceit and very much like him. He's not even going to let his wife know. Something being said about the difference between uh, view of the two sexes amongst the Greeks as well. Women are not seen to be equal to men. That's a complex story. We won't get into this, uh, that topic here. But uh, what we find in, in 17, line 360, I'm not going to read it here, uh, Athena actually admits that killing some suitors uh, will seem less morally justifiable than others. Some of them are actually better than others. But I want you to kill them all, says Athena. Yet some of them aren't quite as guilty as others, but I want you to kill them all all the same. The god, the goddess, seems to be harsher and less just than Odysseus would be. And this is one of the problems for me in the text. And it's going to be a problem for the philosophers, as I say, who are going to look at this. Like the goddess, it seems like it's, it's not eye for an eye. Like it's not justice here that you're talking about. It's vengeance. You're going to, and you're saying that Odysseus ought to do it. And it's not just because he's angry and he's been outraged. It's because you are telling him to do this. And so there's something, wisdom seems to diverge from justice here. And it just goes into vengeance. But she orders it. And so he does it. And we get a moral, uh, a moral polarization. We get the good, and there are very few good. And then we get the bad characters, and there are a great many of those. And there's going to be a separation of the two. The good will remain. The, the, the evil, they're going to be taken out. And maybe it's like a warning. Yeah, you don't even want to be associated with that. So in the future, whether you did the evil, whether you cooperated with the evil, whether you were silenced in the presence of evil, you're still going to be treated the same. The gods are going to punish you for not speaking against it. Now, 
Now, it's not that Odysseus doesn't trust Penelope. He does, but he's still not going to reveal himself to her. So if you want to look at uh, book 18, line 283, you can see that Odysseus ha has some trust in Penelope. It's not that he distrusts her. He's just not going to reveal who he is. Uh, but one of the questions that I have, and you probably have, is, is Odysseus justified in slaughtering all the suitors? And it doesn't seem to be to me by my light. But, but he's ordered by the god, goddess to do it, and so he does it. So it is justified in that sense. He obeys those in authority over him. But it's not justified on a moral level, and this is the problem with the portrait of justice in um, Homer. Uh, oh, I wanted to go to another passage because this is too good not to. I think I mentioned this before, but um, in Book 17, the famous encounter. Remember, we said that Eudis um, Odysseus is disguised and that he won't tell anyone, and he doesn't tell anyone aside from his son, who is now like him, he, and he's grown up. So again, the progress of the character, extraordinary. They're like, so Athena and Odysseus were two of a kind, so is Odysseus and his son Telemachus. He, he's grown up, he's gonna act like a man. But there are two characters that recognize Odysseus along the way without him revealing himself, and the first one, this is telling, or rather it is moving, let me pick it up, uh, book 17, so page 260, if you have it, uh, line 290. These two were conversing thus with each other. A dog who was lying there raised his head and ears. This was Argos, patient-hearted Odysseus's dog, whom he himself raised, but got no joy of him, since before that he went to sacred Ilion, again, Troy. In the days before, the young men had taken him out to follow goats of the wild and deer and rabbits, but now he had been put aside with his master absent and lay on the deep pile of dung from the mules and oxen which lay abundant before the gates so that the servants of Odysseus could take it to his great estate for manuring. Now, there's all sorts of things being said here. The, if the manure is in the gates, this is not a place where justice is. The justice is dispensed in around the gates. Now it's a pile of dung there. Again, a representation of how bad things have got there. But also, Odysseus's dog is being neglected and is lying on top of the dung. Abuse or neglect. Certainly not treatment, uh, suitable treatment. And there the dog Argos lay in the dung, all covered with dog ticks. Now, as he perceived that Odysseus had come close to him, he wagged his tail and laid both of his ears back. Only he now no longer had the strength to move any closer to his master, who, watching him from a distance, without Eumaeus noticing, secretly wiped a tear away and said to him, Eumaeus, this is amazing. This dog that lies in the dunghill, the shape of him is splendid, and yet I cannot be certain whether he had the running speed to go with his, with his beauty. Or is it just one of the kind of table dog that gentlemen keep, and it is only for show that their masters care for him? He knows who the dog is, right? He's identified him. That's why the tear of, of recognition. But he wants to hear more about it because this has all been, remember, he's had 20 years. He loved the dog, the puppy. He raised the puppy up. The puppy recognizes his master. His master's come back home. The dog alone recognized him. Extraordinary. You know how dogs have this extraordinary ability to smell things that people don't and know things. It's, it's, it really is extraordinary. But he does recognize him, and, and Odysseus is moved by this. And he wants to know more, and then Eumaeus tells him the story about what a dog this was. He was a great dog, fast, etc. And then he comments at his master. Let me go to this, 317, 318. His master, far from his country, has perished, and the women are careless and do not look after him. And serving men, when their masters are no longer about to make them work 
are no longer willing to do their rightful duties. For Zeus of the, wi of the wide brows takes away one half of the virtue from a man once the day of slavery closes upon him. Now, what is being said here? This is, a, this is an indictment of slavery, what it does to a person. It, it, he's not talking about they becoming bad people. He's saying something their human dignity is robbed of them, and they act in accordance with that. And this is why he stands out, because he doesn't do that. Right? This is a king's son who still behaves with all of the virtue that one would have expected, as if his master were present. Just totally contradicts the, the rule of the standard rule of how slaves will behave, he being one. Again, very interesting little comments uh, uh, thrown in there. So he, he is recognized there. We're going to find that he is recognized again in the famous passage where he is revealed again by accident. There are three scenes, by the way, of recognition. First one, just the dog, Argos. The second one, his nurse. Let me go to that. Book 19, 420. His, her name is Eurycleia. And she knew him when he was a baby. She suckled him at her breast. So she, he's the son of a, of, a, of a king and queen, and they don't do the nursing themselves. They give it to a wet nurse, and the wet nurse nurses him. So this woman brought him up, literally, at her breast. And she watched him grow up, probably has fond feelings to him, and saw him that, after all, this is not just any baby. This is the, the king that she's nursing, and now she's proud of him. And she remembers all sorts of stories about him growing up. No doubt she, when, when things happen, she'd be proud. Oh, she's in the background, whatever. So she knows things about him. And she will also recognize him. But how will she recognize him? Not the way Argos did, but from his suffering, signs of his suffering, which she remembers. And this is the one. So 380, she says of him, it's rather extraordinary, he says, she says, I have never seen one as like as you are to Odysseus, both as to your feet and voice and appearance. And he's like, hmm. Uh-oh. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke and turned and answered her, So I'll say, old dame, who with their eyes have looked on the two of us, they say we two are very similar, each to each, as you yourself have noticed, and tell me. So he spoke. And the old woman took up the shining basin she used for foot washing. And she's going to wash his feet with it. Tells us how she does it, whatever. And as she gets there, and she's about to wash his feet, and he's going to have to pull his robe aside, he realizes, oops, this is a problem. Because when he does this, she's going to see the scar on his leg. And that's the towel. It's, a, it's not just a scar, it's a shape, and it's like it, it's going to be a big scar. So what did she say? Now Odysseus was sitting close to the fire, but suddenly turned to the dark side. For presently he thought in his heart that as she handled him, she might be aware of his scar, and all his story might come out. She came up close and washed her lord, and at once she recognized that scar, which once the boar with his white white tusk had inflicted on him when he went to Parnassus to Autolycus and his children, his father-in-law. This was his mother's noble father who surpassed all men in thievery and the art of the oath and the god Hermes himself had endowed him for he had pleased him by burning the thigh bones of lambs and kids, etc. We're going to find out about the whole story of Odysseus, his father-in-law who was also a thief and whatever and how he came to get the scar. It will go on so she's about to, she sees the scar, she knows who it is, and at the moment you think, what's going to happen? And what do we get? This huge digression of a story. It goes on for pages about how he got the scar. And the wild boar that came out to get him, and he's a young boy. When well, boy, he's in his teens. And the boar, think of a boar, don't think of a pig. This is 500 pounds. This is potentially 800 pounds. It's the size of this table. It's the height of this table. It has tusks. These are nasty creatures. You hunt them, they are going to hunt you. 
They are nasty. Uh, boars will also eat anything. You fall into a pig pen, the pigs will eat you, including the bones. They, are, they eat everything. They're omnivores, right? This is a nasty creature. It's not that they're carnivores. They go out hunting things, but they'll eat anything. And if you're hunting them, they're going to turn on you because they've got these sharp tusks. He's hunting a boar, and the boar decides, I'm, I've had enough of this guy. He weighs, what, 200 pounds. I weigh three times as much, and I've got the tusks. So he comes charging out at him, and Odysseus manages to get the spear into him to kill him, but before that, the tusk goes through his thigh, cutting it to the bone. So this is a big, deep scar. He's not recovering from this quickly. That's, that story is told, it's a heroic story in itself. A young boy killing a wild boar is, is no small feat. And she sees this, the story, and 467, the old woman at the end of hundreds of lines, holding him in the palm of her hands, recognized this scar as she handled it. She let his foot go so that his leg, which was in the basin, fell free and the bronze echoed. The basin tipped over on one side and the water spilled out on the floor. It's almost like the phrase in English, spilled the beans. It's all out, the clash, the sound, it's all, you think it's over, right? So the, the suspense, the, the suspense uh, uh, builds, and then the sign that something's being revealed, and uh-oh. And she is delighted. He's been away for 20 years. She thought he was dead. He's right in front of her. Nobody knows. Pain and joy seized her at once, and both eyes filled with tears, and the springing voice was held within her. She took the beard of Odysseus in her hands and spoke to him. Then, dear child, you are really Odysseus. I did not know you before, not until I touched my Lord all over. She spoke and turned her eyes towards Penelope, because, of course, she also knows what her... Uh, what the lady of the house most desires, which is for him to be there. I got to tell her. It's wishing to indicate to her beloved husband's presence, but Penelope was not able to look that way or perceive him since Athena turned aside her perception, turned her head, <laughs> don't look that way. There was the clattering of the, you know, the uh, basin on the floor. Of course she's going to look that way. Athena turns her head and then Odysseus groped for her and took her by the throat with his right hand. While with the other, he pulled her closer to him and said to her, Nurse, why are you trying to kill me? You yourself suckled me at your own breast, and now at last, after suffering much, I have come in the 20th year back to my own country. But now that you have learned who I am, and the God put it into your mind, hush, let nobody else in the palace know of it, for so I tell you straight out, and it will be a thing accomplished if you do, and by my hands the god beats down the arrogant suitors. Nurse of mine, though you are, I will not spare you when I kill the rest of the serving maids in my palace. Okay. Why does he say such? So? She's outraged at the threat. Then in turn, circumspect Eurycleia said to him, My child, what sort of word escaped your teeth's barrier? The exact same thing that Zeus said to Athena, right? You know what strength is steady in me, and it will not give away at all, but I shall hold as stubborn as stone or iron. And put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. If by your hands the god beats down the arrogant suitors, then I will give you the list of those women who in your palace have been mutinous against you and tell you which are innocent. Okay, so what's she saying? Why don't you trust me? But she's saying more than that. I will tell you who you can trust in your own house and who you can't. And he doesn't trust her. So he knows the nurse. He didn't trust the nurse because he already knew her character. She's going to go after her enemies in the household. There are women there in the household that have slighted her probably. He doesn't trust her judgment. He's going to judge himself. But she's saying, and so this is why he turns on her. As much as, clo as close as she is, her character is not adequate to let her know. Right? So it's interesting. It seems very harsh. I mean, it is very harsh. I'll kill you. He needs to threaten her because she all, he knows enough about her character. I think that's what's being said here. But the identity that goes with the scar, the pain that goes with the scar, the story that goes with the scar, um, that whole excerpt. And it goes on and on and on. And the detail is exhaustive. You will never find this in scripture, an account like this. 
they never go into the great story detail of how something came about. It's very briefly told. It's enough to give you a lot to think about, but you have to imagine it. It's not being told to you. Epic poets write differently. Think about the stories of Jacob and, and uh, Abraham and Joseph and whatever. Little details make you marvel and wonder what on earth they were thinking at that point, but we're never told. Here we get a whole background story. It's, it's just a different style, if you will. So he's recognized by his dog, he's recognized by Eurycleia, and finally he's going to be recognized when he reveals himself. And how is that going to come about? Well, it's not going to come about by him saying, all right, Odysseus is here. It's through a contest. It's called the contest of the bow. Now, this is really interesting. And again, that revelation also comes from the gods. It comes by a dream. Penelope has a dream. Let's see if I can find it here. I think it's in 21. 21. Uh, da, 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 da. 535, that can't be because there is no 535 to 21. It must be earlier. Contest of the bow. There it is. It is uh, just a few hundred lines on from there. I think it's in 19. Yes. And let me correct my notes here so I don't do this again. Uh, uh, here it is. Come, listen to a dream of mine and interpret it to me. I have 20 geese here about the house and they feed on grains of wheat from the water trough. I love to watch them, but a great eagle with crooked beak came down from the mountain and broke the necks of them all and killed them. So the whole 20 lay dead about the house, but he soared high in the br bright air. Then I began to weep, that was in my dream, and cried out aloud and around me gathered the fair haired Achaean woman, as I cried out, sorrowing, sorrowing for my geese killed by the eagle. But he came back again and perched on the jut of the gabled roof. He now had a human voice and spoke aloud to me, Do not fear, O daughter of far-famed Icarius. This is no dream, but a blessing real as day. You will see it done. The geese are the suitors, and I, the eagle, have been a bird of portent, but now I am your own husband. Come home, and I shall inflict shameless destruction on all the suitors. So he spoke, and then the honey sweet sleep released me. Then I looked about and saw the geese in my palace feeding on their grains of wheat from the water trough, just they had as they had been. <laughs> How can she not understand the dream? It's been revealed to what was meant by this is not like Pharaoh's dream to Joseph. Right? The cows, the seven fat cows, or the sheaves of wheat. It's none of those things. The dream is told to her. It's, you know, the, the eagle is Odysseus. And she still doesn't get it. Why? The only thing I can suggest is the effect of suffering and uh, the uh, resultant depression that comes from it. Um, I don't know, I, I'm no uh, psychologist, mental health worker, but I am told that those who are in depression are in mo most at risk when they're not at their bottom. That's not when they're most at risk. It's when they're coming out of the depression that they're at risk. And the reason why they're at risk then is because they know that it can get worse, because they've been worse and they don't want to go back there. So people who are at risk to themselves are actually when they're starting to get better. People think, ah, they made a turn for the better. And everyone says, that's a sigh of relief, right? Because this person was severely distressed. And now she seems a little bit brighter. Oh, good. Everyone's very happy. And then uh, I think that's it with Penelope. She doesn't want, she doesn't dare to hope because if she, her hopes are dashed, she will be devastated. She won't be able to handle it. So this is realistic to me. This is a very realistic portrait. I mean, the, uh, in, in terms of human nature, how it works. 
But in terms of the revelation, I mean, <laughs> there's no problem interpreting the dream. It, it interpreted itself. The gods revealed it to her. This is exactly what it means. Odysseus didn't do it. It came to her. And what does Odysseus say? Resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her. Lady, it's impossible to read this dream and avoid it by turning another way. She's, he's baffled. How can you not get this? Since Odysseus himself has told you its meaning, how it will end, the suitor's doom is evident for one and all. No one will avoid his death and destruction. So she's in denial. She can't. Anyone who has done grief counseling recognizes that this sort of thing happens. It's very realistic. Not to have hope, but then to think that you might have hope and it might be dashed, that is in some ways worse. I can live with the depression. Don't give me hope that won't come true. I, that I can't live with. Don't raise my hopes up. And she answers to him, my friend, dreams are things hard to interpret, hopeless to puzzle out, and people find that not all of them end in anything. And then she says something here that you're going to hear echoed in Virgil about dreams. You'll pick this, this exact phrase up, write, note it for yourself. There are two gates through which the insubstantial dreams issue. One pair of gates is made of horn and one of ivory. Those of the dreams which issue through the gate of sawn ivory, these are deceptive dreams. Their message is never accomplished. But those that come into the open through the gates of the polished horn accomplish the truth for any mortal who sees them. I do not think that this strange dream that I had come to me came through this gate. My son and I would be glad if it did so. And put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. This dawn will be a day of evil name, which shall take me away from the house of Odysseus. For now I will set up a contest. So she is done with it. She has used her strategies, her deceit for years to keep the suitors at bay and she's given up. I'm not, it's, so it's come down to the wire. She is at her wits end. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to set up a contest. Those axes, which in this place, he used to set up an order that is her husband, so that 12 in all, they stood in a row like timbers to hold a ship. He would stand far off and send a shaft through them. Have you ever seen the axes, the old axes in the head and it's held in place and there's a hole in it and he would shoot it through the 12 in a row. Now to do that, you have to pull the shaft back very far and shoot it very straight. You have to be extraordinarily strong because it's going to go directly through. It's not going to go down with gravity, right? And he used to be able to do that. And that's the contest. That one who can shoot an arrow clean through all the 12 axes shall be the one I will go away with forsaking this house where I was a bride, a lovely place and full of good living. I think that even in my dreams, I shall never forget it. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her. Now note that he had no plan. Now the plan has been given to him through her dream. Aha, this is how I'm going to do it. And then the plot, how am I going to deal with the suitors? It hatches out of this. Again, initiated by the God's vision to his wife. He sa she says, O respected wife of Odysseus, son of Laertes, do not put off this contest in your house any longer. Before these people can handle the well-wrought bow and manage to hook the string and bend it and send a shaft through the iron, Odysseus of the many designs will be back here with you. Quite the statement. How on earth could a man, a stranger, make such a statement? Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, if my friend you were willing to sit by me in my palace and entertain me, no sleep would be drifted over my eyelids, but it is in no way possible for people forever to go without sleep, and the immortals have given to mortals each his own due share over the grain-giving corn land. So I shall now go back again to my upper chamber and lie on my bed, which has made a sorrowful thing now always disordered with the tears I have wept ever since Odysseus went away to that evil, not to be mentioned, Ilion. There I must lie, but you can sleep here in the house, either bedding down on the floor or they can make a bed for you. And she goes back with women to attend her and Greya Athena casts sleep over her eyes. That's how the 19th book ends. Okay, so the contest of the bow has been set up. We now know how judgment is going to happen. The gods have revealed how it's through the contest of the bow. This will allow the third scene of discernment. There was 
Argos the dog, there's Eurycleia the maid, and now the contest of the bow. And the contest of the bow is an interesting revelation because it's going to show something else. This is something only Odysseus could do. It requires strength. It requires technical skill. And that is what he's going to uh, use to now reveal himself, but also take care of his opponents. There are good omens, by the way, in the morning. I'll skip over that. The suitors arrive. There's a fight scene. Um, there's a lot of fight scenes, but not nearly as many as the, the Iliad. There are countless fight scenes. It is war and war and war. This is a man returning from war, and he wants to come home. He, this is a man of peace now. He doesn't want any more fighting, but guess what? Justice needs to be done. So Penelope fetches his bow. And this is uh, 21. Promises marriage to the best archer. Telemachus himself sets up the axes, but he can't do it. Not that he was going to marry his mother, but just like test it. The suitors aren't even able to string the bow. Now, if you think of, you know what a bow is like, you do. Like it's, a, it's straight. You can't leave it bent all the time because it eventually will, will snap. Right? It's taut and it's, it's springy, but it, it, it has to be in serious tension. Well, to do that, you have to bend the bow and you have to have terrific strength to bend it. And then you got to sling the hoop around it so that it the so that's what you have to do first. This is part of the contest. It's not just shooting the uh, arrow through it. You have to be strong enough to actually string the bow. They can't even string the bow. The suitors. That's already a reveal. Now Odysseus finally does reveal himself to Eumaeus. By the way. Um, right here at the ends and asks for a try at the bow. Now remember, he is a stranger and he seems like a beggar and they're going to mock him, you know, because they can't, the strongest of them can't even string the bow. And he says, yeah, can I have a try? And they're like, you dog, and they want to kick him, punch him, like, how dare you? You can't do this. They object to him even trying to do that. And then he goes up and it's sort of, and you see this in film sometimes where a pin can drop. Why? Because he just, he strings the bow and he does it with ease. Just goes, like, because he's done it a thousand times. And at that point, the suitors are, the, you can imagine the eyes in the room. And then he pulls the string back and then he shoots the arrow through it, of course. But at that point, more is, a, a lot more is revealed at this point. One, he's just identified himself as Odysseus, of course, because only Odysseus could do this. Another is that he has now been promised by his wife that she will marry the man who does it. Well, it just happens to be her husband already. But thirdly, the man who could do such a thing when they can't even string the bow is a very dangerous man with a bow in his hand, and there are no other weapons in the room. And he says, son, lock the door, bar the door. Uh Uh-huh. And now panic sets in. And Athena is very happy at what's about to happen. Battle royale. Odysseus reveals himself. What do we get here? This is book 22. He shoots Antinous, by the way, the first of them. He was on the point of lifting up a fine two-handed goblet of gold, had it in his hands, was moving it so as to drink of the wine, and in his heart there was no thought of death. For who would think that one man, alone in a company of many men at their feasting, though though he were a very strong one, would ever inflict death upon him and dark doom? But Odysseus, aiming at this man, he's a particularly bad man, treated him particularly badly as a stranger, so he deserves for treating uh, with inhospitality the beggar. Uh, He deserves punishment. He was also bad throughout. Aiming at this man struck him in the throat with an arrow and clean through the soft part of the neck, the point was driven. He slumped away to one side. Out of his stricken hand fell the goblet and up and through his nostrils there burst a thick burst of mortal blood and with a thrust of his foot he kicked back the table from him, etc. I don't know. 
dispense with my enjoyment of the passage. So he, and the suitors turn on him, and the stranger, it was badly done to hit men. They're very angry. You will never achieve any more trials. Now your sudden destruction is certain. For now you have struck down the man who is far the greatest of the youth of Ithaca. For that the vultures shall eat you. So they abuse him with their language. This is called flighting. This is what men do before they fight. They chirp. It's like hockey. Like the the chirping first, and then pop. Right? So they flight him first with their words. You know, that... So they're, and they want to intimidate him. You're, you're, the vultures are going to feast on your flesh. Each spoke at random, for they thought he had not intended to kill the man. Poor fools. And they had not yet realized how over all of them the terms of death were now hanging. But looking darkly upon them, resourceful Odysseus answered, You dogs, you never thought that I would any more come back from the land of Troy. And because of that, you despoiled my household and forcibly took my serving women to sleep beside you and sought to win my wife while I was still alive, fearing neither the immortal gods who hold the wide heaven nor any resentment sprung from men to be yours in the future. Now upon all of you, the terms of destruction are fastened. So he spoke and the green fear took hold of all of them. It's green, it's new. They never had any fear. The green fear took hold of all of them, and each man looked about him for a way to escape sheer death. Only Eurymachus spoke up and gave him an answer. If in truth you are Odysseus of Ithaca, come home. What you have said is fair about all the wickedness done you by the Achaeans, much in your house and much in the country. But now the man is down who, had, who was responsible for all this, Antinous. He, it's his fault. You've already killed him. This is a man who's quick on his feet. It was he who pushed this action, not so much that he wanted the marriage or cared for it, but with other things in mind, which the son of Cronos would not grant him to lie in wait for your son and kill him, and then be king himself in the district of strong-founded Ithaca. Now he has perished by his own fate. Then spare your own people, and afterward we will in public make public reparation for all that has been eaten and drunk in your halls, setting upon each upon himself an assessment of 20 oxen. We will pay it back in bronze and gold to you until your heart is softened. Till then, we cannot blame you for being angry. Okay, peace offering. Then looking darkly at him, resourceful Odysseus answered, Eurymachus, if you gave me all your father's possessions, all that you have now, and what you could add from elsewhere, even so I would not stay my hands from the slaughter until I had taken revenge for all the suitors' transgression. Now the choice has been set before you, either to fight me or run, if any of you can escape death and its spirits. But I think not one man will escape from sheer destruction. (laughs) So he spoke, and the other's knees, and the heart within them went slack. But Eurymachus cried a second time to the suitors, Dear friends, now this man will not restrain his invincible hands, but since he has got the polished bow and and the quiver, he will shoot at us from the smooth threshold until he has killed us one and all. Then let us all remember our warcraft. Draw your swords and hold the table before you to ward off the arrows of sudden death. Let us all make a rush against him together and try to push him back from the doors and the threshold and go through the town so the hue and cry could be most quickly raised, and perhaps this man will now have shot for the last time. This man keeps his head. The problem is, only he has his sword. So he spoke aloud and drew from his side the sharp sword, brazen and edged on either side, and made a rush at him, crying his terrible cry at the same time noble Odysseus shot an arrow and struck him in the chest. Bang. And Telemachus carries on, etc. Um, I'll skip over the slaughter that ensues. The baddest of the bad, well, yeah, I've sort of run out of time. Um, Final situation here uh, is when, uh, I mean, I I can go on at length, is when Athena, or rather when the battle is over, and now we come with Penelope and Odysseus. 
Let me just, ever so briefly. And Odysseus reproaches Penelope for not receiving him. I won the contest. I'm telling you I'm Odysseus. And you want, I mean, she's basically snubbing him. And he's upset with her. You know, what sort of woman are you? I've been away for 20 years. I'm here. And you don't even appear happy. Like, what is going on? Two things are going on. One, it's still the fact, fact that she can't believe what she sees. She thinks it's a god that's tricking her. Some, I don't want to believe this. Again, think about the psychological motivation. The second thing is she's just like him. She's a deceiver. She's not going to put her cards on the table. Uh-uh. She's going to have to make sure that it's him. So she asks him a story. She tells him a story. And she says, because she's already promised herself to him, okay, we'll go to bed together. Go get the bed. So she says, you're a clea, then remember the nurse. Make up a firm bed for him outside the well-fashioned chamber, that very bed that he himself built. For the firm bed here outside for him, put it out there and cover it with fleeces and blankets and with shining coverlets. So that bed, which he made, put it outside the chamber and he loses it. What man, she says, what you have said, dear lady, has hurt my heart deeply. What man has put my bed in another place? But it would be difficult for even a very expert one, unless a god coming to help in person was easily to change its position. There is no mortal man alive, no strong man who lightly could move the weight elsewhere. There's one particular feature in the bed's construction. I myself, no other man made it. There was an olive tree. What did he made? He made it out of the tree that was in the ground. You can't move that bed because it's made out of the tree. How is it possible? Who moved that? Only he knew, knew this. Only Odysseus and she knew this. And now the reveal, she knows that it's him. And now, then she throws himself around, herself around his neck and says, oh, it's you, Odysseus. I didn't, dip, right? But note, she used right to the end her cunning, her techne, her craft, her wisdom. She kept her head. She's just like him. She's just like Athena, etc. But she outfoxes him in the end. Didn't expect that. The scene goes on. A slaughter is about to ensue. The relatives of the suitors are going to kill him. And then the gods intervene. Stop it from happening. Right? They began the whole plot. They conclude the whole plot. And I'll leave it off with that.